Last week, inflation hit levels unseen since Brian Mulroney was leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada and Brian Adams was at the top of the pop charts. As it did in 1983, it means paying more for essential goods from food to gasoline and housing. Here on what's causing the problem and whether anyone, anyone, has the tools to fix it. Let's welcome, in Chicago, Illinois, economist Mike Moffat, senior director at the Smart Prosperity Institute think tank and an assistant professor at Western University's Ivy Business School. In the nation's capital, Armin Yalnesian, economist and Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. And here in our studio, Craig Alexander, chief economist and executive advisor at Deloitte Canada. And we're delighted to welcome you three back onto our program tonight, even if the subject matter is rather depressing. And let's just show a chart off the top here just to show everybody where things are at in terms of inflation in Canada. If we go back to 2019, the annual inflation rate in the country was below 2%, 1.9. In 2020, it was below 1%, 0.7%. In 2021, 3.4% as COVID started to take root. And in May of 2022, the annualized inflation rate in Canada is 7.7%. Okay, Armin, get us started here. COVID-19, supply chain issues, the war in Ukraine, we have heard these issues before. Is there anything you want to add to that list in terms of why inflation is suddenly out of control? I think uh, in Canada, we noticed that in the last month, we were returning also not only to the basics of food, shelter, and gas, uh, rising because of all of the things you just said. But also there was a new discretionary element, which is people deciding that COVID is over and wanting to party. And so both flights and hotels, all that recreational stuff pushed the difference between the previous month and this month's inflation uh, more rapidly than we have seen since the summer of 2020 when everybody wanted to renovate their houses because they couldn't go anywhere and softwood lumber was the discretionary uh, part of inflation. This is really troubling because food, shelter and gas are non-discretionary and there is nothing on the horizon showing us how that might be modulated except for the Fed hikes, the central bank hikes that will definitely cool that part of the market, but uh, won't make food or gas any more uh, accessible and affordable to especially low-income Canadians. Mike Moffat, same question. What would you add to the original list? Yeah, so I'd also add uh, refinery capacity. We had a number of refineries uh, shut down in the United States during COVID that haven't reopened yet. Because we've seen oil prices this high before. They were this high eight years ago, but we didn't have two bucks a liter gas back then. And that's been part of the issue that uh, normally the spread on a refinery is about 10 to $15 a barrel between the difference of uh, a barrel of oil and refined products. That's now up to the 45 to $60 a barrel range. So that's one of the things that's uh, causing drivers to pay more, but those oil prices and high gas prices percolate through the economy because, you know, shipping and, and other things like that. So that is, uh, I think, an underrated driver of that. And as uh, the Biden administration looks to get some of those refineries open again, that should uh, eat some inflationary pressures. Craig, your take. Well, I think the, the really notable element is how broad based it actually is. Um, what we're seeing is rising prices in, in absolutely every category, including elements um, that typically you don't see price pressures. So, for example, uh, clothing and footwear are often a category where we see very low price inflation, uh, often discounting, and yet you're, you're still seeing price, prices rising there at more than 2%. And then, as, as already mentioned, you have the staple goods where you're seeing very, very strong price gains, uh, including food and energy and, and, and real staples. And I think the real concern from a point of view of the central banks is how it's broadening out. And what we're really seeing is it, it's, it's, it's coming both on the, on the supply side and the demand side. And I think that's also the source of concern. Initially, what we saw was the ramp up in, in, in inflation started off on the supply side because of the, the breaking down of uh, supply chains during the, the pandemic, and central banks said, okay, that's temporary, that's transitory, that will pass. But then we started to see some demand side pressures starting to build, and then we got a second supply shock from the war in Ukraine. 
And what that really did was broaden out the inflation and uh, the inflationary pressures mm -hmm. that really force the central banks to say, okay, we can't wait. You've uh, kind of anticipated my follow-up question for Mike, which is, when inflation seems to take root, it also seems to be very difficult to control once it starts rising. It just seems to go and go and go. Why is that? Well, we tend to see these inflationary spirals. That If you think prices are going to go up 5 to 10% of the next year, you're going to buy that car now or that dishwasher now. You're not going to let your money depreciate. So uh, expectations of future inflation tend to cause inflation today. And I think that's why it's going to be so important for our central banks around the world and our governments to uh, address this issue, get those expectations under control. Because in economics, we do see a lot of these self-fulfilling prophecies, and this is certainly one of those. Okay. And in which case, Armin, earlier this uh, month, the Federal Reserve in the United States raised the interest rates by 0.75. Do you think the Bank of Canada should do the same? Start us off on that. Well, our inflation rate is not as accelerated as in the United States. Nobody does extreme like the U.S. So 0.75, like 75 basis points is what they're going to do. Will we do the same? I would be surprised if we went that far, but it depends on how the central bank is reading uh, the tea leaves right now. We've already seen a cooling in the housing market. They know that that's the only part of the market that they can affect. Rising interest rates are going to do nothing about planting crops in uh, the world to make sure that the food supply, the food shortages don't trickle into commodity prices. Rising prices aren't going to do anything about opening up refineries or increasing the amount of oil being shipped per day. So really the only part of the inflation puzzle that central banks can, can um, affect is the housing market. And we are already seeing early signs of that. So will they double down? Um, I don't know, but because uh, I'm not a central banker, but uh, if I was a central banker, I'd be very worried about the tightrope we are all walking. You know, all the central banks are working in lockstep across Euro the European Union, in the United States, in Canada. And that tightrope is um, you cool down growth too much because that's all rising rates can do is cool demand. You cool down demand too much and you risk triggering a recession. The United States already had a quarter of contraction. We don't know if they're heading into a second quarter, which is the technical definition of a recession. The only good news in this story um, is that we are sitting on record, like half century low unemployment rates. So even if you cool demand in the form of uh, not hiring as many people or even possibly laying some people off, the tightness in our labor markets, we haven't seen for half a century and that will maintain purchasing power and bargaining power to some extent, which is exactly what you want. You don't want to stifle um, demand to the point where you've got a recession. I was going to ask Craig about that. How unusual is it to have both high inflation and high employment at the same time? Well, you, you often have the, the combination because usually what you have is you know, tightness in the labor market can create some of the inflationary impulse. But in point of fact, we sh I should emphasize that we're not seeing wages actually driving inflation this time around. Um, yes, wages have picked up. We've seen wages in Canada um, increase. So if we look at the last monthly number, wage growth had reached 3.9%. But, and, and, but if you actually look at what's happened to the composition of job creation in Canada, more of the jobs being created um, coming out of the pandemic were higher paying jobs. So if you adjust for the occupations that were being created and you, you, you adjust for that effect, wage growth has probably been really around 3%, certainly not inflationary. So the inflation we're getting actually isn't coming because of the tightness in the labor market causing wages being bid up leading employers to pass along the higher cost of labor uh, to, to consumers. So what's, what's really happened is on the supply side, because of those supply, um, supply chain dislocations caused by uh, the breaking down of supply chains during the pandemic that Canadians are very familiar with when they went to the stores and found that they, you know, they couldn't find what they wanted on the shelves or you know, if you went to the auto dealers and found that there was no new cars for sale because there weren't computer chips for the, for the production of new vehicles, you know, that, that meant that used car prices went through the roof. Uh, 
right? So you had supply side price effects. On the demand side, I think a lot of the, the demand uh, price, price effects came from the, the rebound in demand, partly because of the massive um, income transfers that took place during the pandemic. So, you know, we had a big unemployment shock, like lots of Canadians lost their jobs. Labor compensation during the pandemic fell in 2020, labor compensation fell 1%. Household disposable income increased 9%. And that was a reflection of the massive government transfers that took place. So personal savings increased a lot, partly because of government transfers, but also because Canadians couldn't spend money the way they wanted to. They couldn't buy, they couldn't go to restaurants. They couldn't, they couldn't go to movie theaters. So typically Canadian households save 25 to $35 billion in aggregate a year. Over the, the two years of 2020, 2021, they saved $360 billion. Hmm. And that vast amount of money is basically giving them a pool of money that they could spend. And, and what that means is that as prices have been rising, Canadians have spent. Now, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be, you know, flippant about this. Like, for a lot of low-income Canadians, this high inflation has been punishing, right? But for other Canadians that saved a lot during the recession, they could you know, they could afford higher prices, and that's partly the demand effect. I think probably two-thirds of the inflation we've been seeing is on the supply side. About a third has been on, on the mm. demand side. Well, let me add, uh, Mike, something else to the list that we hear frequently, which is to say the CERB, the amount of government spending that took place, the quantitative easing that took place, a fancy way for saying, I guess, priming the pump and having the government get, uh, get much more actively involved in economic growth and development. Uh, we right. saw that kind of thing take place during the Great Recession of 2008, and yet we did not get the associated inflation that we're getting this time. How come it happened this time and it didn't happen last time? Well, I, I think a couple things. That I think part of it is just the, the size of it. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, both fiscal policy and monetary policy didn't respond strongly enough. So we had a number of years of, of weak growth. And, uh, you know, uh, people who run central banks are a little bit like uh, military generals, that there's this tendency to fight the last war. So I think we probably erred on the side of doing too much this time because we did too little uh, last time. So I certainly think, uh, you know, the level of quantitative easing did play a role, but, you know, it, it was an unprecedented circumstance. We hadn't been in a situation like this in, in over 100 years. There's really no playbook. So uh, central banks around the world were trying to sort of figure out, uh, you know, the level of monetary stimulus to put into the system to make everything work. And, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that maybe they did go a little too far. Uh, OK, you're not the only one who's been saying that. But having uh, having said that, uh, I think, Armin, it's fair to say you couldn't find an economist back during the Great Recession uh, or even now who said that, for example, creating the uh, emergency response benefit was a bad thing to do. The government had to intervene in order to protect people from the worst ravages of this. And yet now we're getting runaway inflation in a way we didn't have when the Great Recession hit back in 2008. Can you add anything to what Mike just said about why that would be? Well, quantitative easing is something central banks do. So CERB wasn't something that the central banks did. That was fiscal policy, and that was meant to... Frankly, it wasn't meant to sustain purchasing power in the sense of... in the sense that Craig was talking about. It was to contain the contagion. Make sure people that, especially those that had been knocked out of low-paying jobs, weren't scrambling to do other jobs. So we didn't, con you know, contaminate everybody. You know, mm -hmm. that, like at, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were actually trying to save one another from the contagion. We're not there anymore, but that's what CERB was about. And that isn't quantitative easing. That was a measure taken to contain the contagion. And nobody said, don't do that, uh, because it made perfect sense. Frankly, um, Canada was really well placed internationally because everybody did wage subsidies to employers to keep people on payroll. Canada was the one of the very few countries I can't think of, actually of another one that introduced that kind of automatic ro robot. You know, you apply for it, you get two thousand dollars spit out at you. 
and then we'll deal with it later on. It was uh, just basically, if you need the money, apply for it and stay at home. And that particular approach in combination with the wage subsidies, which did not turn out to be quite as effective in keeping people connected to payroll when the pandemic was over, um, that particular approach meant that we finished uh, the labor market impacts of the pandemic in October of 2021. Uh, we're now at 117% of the labor market of the pre-pandemic period because our population has grown. The United States is still struggling to get back to pre-pandemic headcounts of jobs. So it was a really good thing for um, minimizing the depth and duration of the labor market impact. And I think that can only be a good thing, uh, especially in an era of population aging where you're getting more exits from than entrance to the labor market, not just in Canada, but in the United States, in Europe, throughout the global north. That's the era that we are in. And um, everybody is dealing with tight labor markets, certainly not just Canada. There, There is a link, though, between the, the quantitative easing and the fiscal response during the, the pandemic, though, right? Because... In effect, what happened was the, the, the government provided massive fiscal support for workers that absolutely had to happen, right? Governments effectively turned off large parts of the economy. And if they're going to do that, they had to provide support to businesses and, and households to help them get through the, 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 the terrible times that they had you know, engineered for the right reasons to, to deal with the health risks. So you had massive uh, income transfers to households and businesses. The, 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 the Bank of Canada embarked on massive quantitative easing, buying Government of Canada bonds. And if you, you look at the quantitative easing that was done, the amount of Government of Canada bonds that were purchased was roughly equivalent to the total size of the federal government deficit in the first year of of the pandemic, right? And the money supply that was created by the quantitative easing, right, was that money was put into the Canadian economy. Now, the difference between the Great Recession of, you know, the, the financial crisis of 0809 and, and the, the pandemic experience, like in Canada, we didn't have quantitative easing during the 0809 financial crisis, but the US did. The difference there is that when, when you study economics, they, they, in first year economics, they tell you if you increase the money supply, you'll increase inflation. Um, in second year economics, they tell you that's not true. Uh, what matters is if you increase the money supply as it circulates through the economy, it'll drive up prices. And the circulation of money is absolutely critical. So what happened during the Great Recession and the financial crisis of 809 was in Europe and in the United States where they did quantitative easing, they increased the amount of money by buying all these bonds, but because of the damage done to the financial system, the money didn't circulate. It sat, sat in bank vaults because the, the banking system was being recapitalized. Mm. This time around, the money was effectively transferred to households through fiscal policy and, that, and some of that money did indeed flow. Now, a lot of it went into savings, but some of it did flow. And that contributed to the demand. It contributed to the strong economic recovery that we've had. So, the, so there is a link here. But the important, but, but as, I, as I tried to, to stress, that, in, that contributed to inflation, but it hasn't been the dominant driver of inflation, right? The, the supply side has still been the dominant mm -hmm. driver. Demand has been a component of it, but the supply side has been the dominant driver. Well, Mike, the thing I'm trying to figure out here is that it's a, it's a tradition that central bankers will, of course, raise interest rates to tackle inflation. That's usually the thing they do. Uh, but nobody wants us to go into recession, uh, which, which sometimes happens when they raise interest rates. So my question is, should we have confidence in the people responsible for doing this, that they will be able to raise interest rates enough to tackle inflation, but not too much to cause a housing crash or a recession. 
That's absolutely the challenge here. I think it was Armin earlier who, who called this a tightrope walking app, and it, it absolutely is. Uh, and it, it's it's going to be a challenge for them. We don't have a playbook for a situation like this. You know, the I, other than uh, the last pandemic, I, I'm thinking maybe the sort of uh, post-war boom after World War II, where you know we we had uh, a bout of inflation then. So this is going to be tough. Uh, the Bank of Canada has uh, some important choices to make, and and probably, frankly, not a lot of faith in their models, given, uh, you know, we weren't predicting two years ago that we'd be in this situation. So um, yeah, I, I'm glad I do what I do. And uh, the bank, can you know, and I'm not at the Bank of Canada because they're going to have to make some really <laughs> tough calls over the next year. Well, OK, Armin, let me get you on that. Should we have confidence that these folks know what they're doing so that they can fight inflation without sending us into a recession? All central banks have got two jobs. One is to stabilize prices, which they probably won't be able to do very much other than in the housing market. And, you know, watch what you wish for because we might see a price correction if they keep picking it up. Um, the second job that central banks have to do is, as somebody else said, I think it was Mike, uh, to control people's expectations about prices. And that's what they're working on right now, is controlling our expectations that they are, in fact, doing everything that can be done through a central bank to stabilize prices. But everybody knows that nothing about higher interest rates is going to do anything about the food and the gas problems that we have that are global. The fact of the matter is Mike has now said twice that there's no playbook for this. And indeed, central banks do not have a playbook for dealing with exogenous supply shocks, such as war and such as pandemic and such as extreme climate events. And we're in a world now where all of these things are unfolding at the same time, plus population aging, which is likely to, you know, we do have tight labor markets. We're not at the end of this process of population aging yet. So tight labor markets are with us for a while to come. Will that mean that wage growth does accelerate as it should in tight labor markets? Or will our public policies doing things like opening the floodgates for temporary foreign workers you know, subdue wage growth. We don't know, that chapter ain't been written yet. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening. And really the best the central banks can do is moderate demand for housing because it's so interest rate specific and moderate our expectations that the people that can do the job are doing the best they can. It's really about the credibility of the central banks at some yeah. level right now too. Yeah. Craig, do you worry about a housing crash? I, I, ex I firmly expect we're going to see a correction in Canadian home prices. We saw um, national average home prices went up 33% during the, the pandemic, 40% on average in Ontario. Um, with interest rates coming up, I, I don't think it's a question if we're going to see a, 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 a correction in home prices. I think just the Bank of Canada has told us that they're going to take policy interest rates to what they think is neutral, and that means an overnight rate of at least 3%. And, and we're currently at 1.5%. So we have another, at a minimum, we have another one and a half percentage point increase to go just for them to get to what they would consider to be neutral. And I think that's enough to cause home prices to pull back. And homeowners won't like that answer, but you know, I think home prices went too far and home housing affordability is, is an enormous problem. Hmm. Um, and I think that from the point of view of, you know, um, you know, I think the Bank of Canada has incredibly talented people. I have, I think they are the best in the business when it comes to running monetary policy. I just think they have an enormously difficult task ahead of them. Um, I think that it, it is all about managing expectations. I think they know that they can't man they they can't manage the the supply side of the equation. But, but they, they need to cool down the demand side. And I think they're gonna, they're gonna walk that, that fine line. I personally think the biggest risk in terms of the economic outlook for Canada and the recession risk is actually what happens coming out of the United States. I think the US economy is overheating more than Canada. And I think there's probably bigger risks that the US uh, raises rates too aggressively and if the U.S. goes into a recession, I think it'll pull down Canada as well. As it always does. So I would, I would keep, as much as I would keep an eye on what the Bank of Canada is doing, I would, I would keep an eye on what the U.S. 
Federal Reserve is doing just as much. Okay. Armin, um, w with a little over five minutes to go here, let me raise another issue with everybody, and that is market consolidation. And I guess one of the bigger examples of that right now is Rogers attempting to buy Shaw. We're talking about massive multi-billion dollar mergers here and so on. It's happening in other sectors as well. Fewer players in more sectors often leads to higher prices for consumers. And I wonder how much of that is part of the story we've been talking about tonight. What an excellent question. Uh, we saw a wave of corporate consolidation in the wake of the 2008-9 Great Recession, as you put it. Uh, the collapse of the global financial order made borrowing money the cheapest it's ever been in history. Mm -hmm. And so there were a number of big players with deep pockets that borrowed money to buy out their competitors. And we're seeing another wave of that right now. Uh, where pandemic economics have actually filled coffers. And there are a handful, you, you mentioned uh, the telecommunications sector, which has historically been marked by um, an oligopoly, just a small number of players that set prices. It's happening in food. It's happening in auto. It's happening in mining. It is happening in wheat. It is happening in more and more sectors. And this is something that we absolutely need the Competition Bureau to expand its arm of regulation to being a consumer ad advocate. And we don't have a consumer advocacy body in this country and haven't since, I don't know, I, I don't know if we had one in the 60s, but certainly we are at a moment where um, price setting is the norm for too many industries and uh, affordability is in part all the supply chain issues we've been talking about, also lagging wage growth, but also the ability of large players setting the price on what we consume, and that can't, that can't last. Mike, how do we know whether prices are going up because of worldwide inflation and the influence of that versus uh, some mischievous corporate citizens who are taking advantage of that situation and knocking the prices up and blaming international factors when, in fact, mm -hmm. it's... How do I put this delicately? When it maybe is their greed that's that's calling the shots instead. Yeah, well, it, it's absolutely uh, some of both, and I think the, you know our means right when it comes to uh, corporate concentration. Uh, if you have a very competitive market, uh, what should happen? in a market in a situation like this, where there's a lot of uh, input uh, price rises, is uh, competitive. Competitors will figure out how to become more efficient to try and gain market share. But if there's only two or three companies in a market, they don't really have to do that. They don't need to sort of focus on those efficiencies and instead pass those uh, higher input costs along to consumers. So this is a, a big body of research right now. It seems that every day uh, a, a new central bank or a new academic comes out with a paper on this. Um, but I think we are starting to, to recognize the importance of market structure on both uh, the causes of inflation, but also the factors that can uh, drive prices back down. Well, okay, Craig, pick up on that if you would. I mean, but people are talking about gas, all, gas prices all the time these days. Uh, I don't know what you were doing in Burlington, but I know people here in uh, the capital city were spending two twenty a liter on gas, and now suddenly, all of a sudden, it's down below two. It happened in a week. How does that happen? <laughs> you want me to explain the volatility <laughs> in gas prices? <laughs> Um, well, how much of how much of the 220 was inflation, and how much of it was oil companies taking advantage of what everybody understood to be a volatile situation? Yeah, I, look, I mean, there's when when you're looking at at the movements in 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 prices, there's there's going to be shifts because of what's happening to, to changes in input input costs, and then there's and then there's going to be what companies are doing with margins. And I would I would say that one of the things I would highlight is I, I I do think that that as inflation became a a a, a bigger issue, you create an inflation mindset that suddenly actually gives businesses some pricing power, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, in a sense, consumers become conditioned to actually expect. Higher prices, right? And what that what that what that actually does is it actually gives businesses some ability to to, to increase prices when otherwise they they wouldn't. Have they right? no shame? 
Well, <laughs> it's, you know, the, the, market, the market price is what the person will pay, right? And there are products, you know, there are products that are essential products, right? So there are things that people have to buy. But, but there are also products that people buy because they, they want to purchase them and they have, they have a choice, right? And this is, this, is, this, is, this is why, you know, part of the reason why I brought up that huge pool of savings, because, you know, in some cases, I think consumers are looking at the prices and saying, you know, the, 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 one of the things that, that strikes me is, you know, we have very, very rapid inflation. You know, inflation in, in, in May was 7.7%. Wages are going up at, at 3.9%, right? So inflation's almost 8%. Wages are only going up at half that. Everyone's fine. I look at, I look at, I look at credit card borrowing. Credit card borrowing fell during the pandemic and is only creeping higher at the moment. So how, how is retail spending actually not declining? Right? Why is why why are retail why is retail spending proving resilient right now? I should like in in volume terms. After I strip off strip out prices, why am I not seeing the volume of retail spending falling because people can't afford to make purchases, right? And and it's it it, it obviously the, the 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 answer is that 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 pool of savings is getting absorbed by businesses raising prices, and that's showing up in corporate profits, right? So you can, you can look at the corporate profits and you can say, look, those, those businesses are being greedy, but you can also ask the question, you know, those corporate profits aren't being created out of thin air. Where are they coming from? And they are being right? influenced by the behavior of consumers. They're, they're for being sure. behavior, they're, they're coming from, from consumers. Mm -hmm. Now, right. now if, the, if it's coming from market concentration, which, which, which is where you, you started this, right? Every, you know, like, we believe in competition, right? Like businesses should compete, and competition, you know, com you know, open competition creates creates you know vibrant markets. It creates good, you know, creates productivity. It drives efficiency. It drives economic growth. It creates jobs, right? Monopolies are not something you want, right? So they create they breed inefficiencies. So I'm I'm strongly in favor of our means our means recommendations around you know, strong co competition policy and, and ensuring that we have very competitive markets. So would you vote th right. thumbs down on the Rogers Shaw merger? I know uh, that's, that's another show. That's, that, that's, not, that's not my position to say. But without getting into company names, yeah. the, the, the bottom line is we need healthy competition policy in the country. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I do think, but, but, but I also do think that that the the issue we have right is is a is is a bit of like I do think that that profit margins are being boosted by the fact that consumers are getting conditioned by the inflation environment mm -hmm. and I think the Bank of Canada deflating inflation you know deflating some like taking some of the wind out of the economy will actually Deal, deal part, part, part of that. As we always say, to be continued. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your participation here on TVO tonight. Mike Moffat, Armin Yalnesian, Craig Alexander, great to see you three again. Appreciate it very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.